you know, we're going to start uh, uh, in about a couple of minutes. Uh, and uh, we're just going to go over uh, uh, some of the housekeeping uh, items for the CME, you guys. So the information about CME is uh, going to be displayed. And uh, here is the uh, information about CME. So you can text 20380 at 888-816-4893 and uh, you should do it within 12 hours after the session. Or you can also text an SMS. And for MOC, in the room code is FUTURE54. And uh, now I would like to, uh, you know, uh, invite our uh, speaker, and it's, uh, it's a pleasure and honor to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Sherrod, Dr. Mark Sherrod. He's a professor of medicine at NYU uh, School of Medicine and program director for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy program at NYU Langhorne uh, Health. He has been a professor for over 16 years and has been practicing for over 25 years. He received his medical degree from Columbia University and his residency in internal medicine at Roosevelt Hospital which is presently Mount Sinai West. And later he completed his cardiology fellowship at the Pacific Medical Center uh, in California in San Francisco. And uh, he has been a mentor for uh, many residents, students, and uh, uh, postdoctoral fellows. And uh, also he has published over 160 peer reviewed articles uh, and has published book chapters uh, and um, uh, he's a well-renowned uh, in most of the well-renowned journals. And um, so let's welcome Dr. Sherrod, and we are looking forward to an ex exciting presentation today. Thank you so much. I, I am, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to talk with you um, and, and to share with you some of the progress that's been made and in this, uh, in this uh, condition. I, I hope you can see my screen uh, at this time. Um, and um, just let me know if you can't hear me or if you, you know, if there's, um, if you can't see the slides at any point. So when I started to take care of this condition, um, there was actually little we could do uh, for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And really over the last two decades, there's been enormous progress as in other fields in cardiology. Now, unfortunately, we don't have a cure. Um, we uh, basically treat the sequelae and the problems that can arise in the, in the, in the condition. But most patients with HCM now have um, prolonged survival and can live almost as long as their normal compatriots. Um, so, these are my disclosures. I'm a consultant for Pfizer. Uh, Dicepiramide um, is not approved for obstructive HCM by the US FDA, and it's administered off-label and has been for about 25 years. The myosin ATPase inhibitor afecamptin is in clinical trials and is also not approved by the US FDA at this time. So with contemporary treatment, HCM is now among the most treatable of heart conditions. Sudden death um, is largely preventable by the ICD in selected patients, and its incidence is reduced by gradient elimination in other patients. Stepped management of symptoms in obstructive HCM, that is pharmacotherapy followed by surgery if it's needed, can control limiting dyspnea and angina in the large majority of patients. And stroke from atrial fibrillation is preventable with anticoagulation um, with no X. So sudden death um, is occurs in 0.8% of the patients per year, which is not a super high number uh, compared to patients with, say, coronary disease and LV dysfunction. But since it happens in younger patients, it, it does assume 
an important role in, in our treatment strategies. And so we risk stratify every patient who comes to see us to see if they have a higher, higher risk than 0.8% per year to see if, for example, they might have 2 or 3% per year chance of dying suddenly, in which case a defibrillator might be uh, indicated. And of all the patients who come to see us, about 20% of the patients wind up getting defibrillators. So risk stratification is an important aspect. Uh, we treat symptoms. Uh, we give advice to uh, avoid competitive athletics and extremes of strenuous exercise. That being said, we definitely encourage uh, ath ath um, we definitely encourage exercise, and patients are encouraged to do whatever exercise they want as long as uh, they aren't exhausted and aren't limited um, uh, by particularly obstruction. And um, it's good. You know, exercise we know is, is good for both avoiding obesity and it's also good for muscle tone and preventing frailty. So we definitely encourage exercise, at least at our center, we definitely recommend patients avoid competition. And that really is mainly because of the um, history uh, that we have seen over the years of patients who unfortunately have died suddenly during competition. We test first degree relatives with echo and EKG or the genotype paradigm. We test for and treat hyperlipidemia. And this is uh, mainly to prevent patients from uh, getting coronary disease in their mid to later life uh, because uh, the two diseases are adversely synergistic. And if patients have atrial fibrillation, well, we treat it. And we treat obesity if it's present because I would say 40 to 50% of our patients are overweight, um, either because they're limited um, or because they're afraid to exercise. And so we encourage them to exercise and we have been very aggressive in trying to get patients on weight loss uh, pharmacotherapy over the last year. So ventricular fibrillation is the cause of sudden death. And as I indicated, it's less than 1% per year in non-referred patients. The mean age of sudden death is 44 years, but sudden death has become relatively uncommon at HCM centers due to the risk stratification um, that I've mentioned and due to the implantable defibrillator. In subgroups, the SI sudden cardiac death may occur in as much as 3% per year, and so there's an effort to ascertain which patients are at high risk. I'll mention, you know, just parenthetically that, that, you know, if you look up the first paper about the implanted defibrillator that came from the University of Maryland and Johns Hopkins with Michael Morawski as the first author, um, two of the first three patients that were treated with the implantable defibrillator in the paper that was in the New England Journal of Medicine had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So... The ICD and HCM have been there from the very beginning. So we risk stratify patients, patients who are at high risk, uh, we treat with an ICD and then we treat the symptoms. For patients who are at low risk, we treat the symptoms. And that's, you know, this is really step one. Um, so what are the stratification risk factors? Well, there's massive LV segmental wall thickness on either echo or, I, or a, a CMR of greater than or equal to 30 millimeters. Uh, the average patient who comes to see us is about 21 or 22 millimeters with a range of, you know, next to no thickening, but with obstruction to, I guess, 40 or 45 has been the most that we've ever seen. First degree relatives or close relatives with sudden cardiac death, that's a, a, a risk factor that enhances your um, your, your likelihood to have a conversation with the patient about the benefits and risks of ICDs. Unexplained syncope, especially recurrent within six months of evaluation. Remote syncope is less significant. Now, by unexplained, uh, we mean that the patient doesn't seem to have neurally mediated syncope. That is, you know, the syncope was not associated with nausea or diarrhea or GI distress. It was not provoked by other things that cause neurally immediate syncope like drawing blood or a pain. 
So these are patients who are walking the street or watching TV and suddenly they black out and there's no obvious provoking cause. Some patients develop LV systolic dysfunction. So this is uncommon, about 3% of patients over the long term. And these patients have a higher risk of, of, of ventricular fibrillation and should be given an ICD. And then apical aneurysm, more than a small pouch, um, um, larger aneurysms. And these are caused um, in 95% of patients by mid-LV obstruction and by supply demand ischemia. Uh, at the apex. Additional risk factors in the enhanced guidelines that we tend to use uh, include long runs or repetitive non-sustained VTAC and late gadolinium enhancement greater than 15% of the LV mass. And it has to be bright, brighter than six standard deviations, brighter than a control segment. So one's MRI doctors really should mentioned in their reports, not only that, that LGE is present, but also try to quantify it as, as best they can. Um, and th this is the way it was done in the papers, and um, this is the way we try to do it at NYU. So here with Picrocerus red, we can see a very thick septum with the red fibrosis. And this um, you know, what I can describe it to the patients as being like tough, tough meat. If you if you if you took a bite out of this, it would be be tough. And it would, it's interstitial fibrosis and perivalvular, peri I'm sorry, perivascular fibrosis, chain, stain, strain red, and um, also replacement fibrosis. Um, and it's um, shows up on the uh, the MRIs. So here is a patient where it has shown up. Um, and this patient has mild uh, systolic dysfunction. Most patients with HCM have hyperdynamic uh, function. And here um, you can see this lacy network of fibrosis that is in the septum of this patient. Um, and this patient has considerable uh, fibrosis that's gonna be uh, on the order of about 20% of their LV mass. And here it is on multiple cuts. And by the guidelines, uh, if you have some of these risk factors, an ICD is reasonable by 2A. Certainly if you've got a prior event of VF or sudden cardiac death or sustained VT, an ICD is recommended with a class one. An ICD is reasonable 2A. And then SVT and LGE uh, are, um, um, softer, but um, definitely influencers in our in our decision making. So this paper put this strategy on the map, and I guess we participated in this research. And um, so for people with secondary prevention who've already had a ventricular event uh, at five years, you can see that. It's about seven or eight percent per year um, recurrence of a, um, a device discharge in the people with primary prevention because they have risk factors. It's about three and a half percent per year. And this has really put this strategy on the map. <clears throat> so that's step one should be addressed in all patients come for consultation. And for symptoms, <clears throat> moving on to step two, I often forget this at the end of these talks, so I, I try to put it in the beginning now. <clears throat> if people have severe symptoms due to non-obstructive HCM, yeah. they're often hard to treat. And the reason is they have a small left ventricular and diastolic volume and diastolic dysfunction. And their stroke volume can't increase after exercise because their hearts can't fill. <clears throat> it's very hard to treat small and diastolic volume. So we make every effort to diagnose obstruction, including provocation 
with stress exercise echo. And I can recommend to you postprandial exercise, giving, giving the patient's instructions to bring a sandwich and a piece of fruit to, their, to the echo lab. <clears throat> we have them eat it about a half hour before um, they get on the treadmill. And, and this is very useful in provoking obstruction uh, because of the splanchnic dilatation that eating provokes and the drop in systemic vascular resistance. <clears throat> so we use empiric trials of rapamil or beta blockade, but they I must say they usually don't work very well for the people who have really severe symptoms. Diuretics can be very helpful in patients with pulmonary congestion or fluid retention and edema. <clears throat> The myosin ATPase inhibitors are being trialed for non-obstructive HCM, but they're not approved for that. They do enhance LV relaxation, and we're hopeful that the trials will be positive in non-obstructive HCM. But for now, MAVA is only indicated for LV outflow tract obstruction, and Avicamptin is being trialed for LV outflow tract obstruction. So what do we do if the standard medications fail and the LV and diastolic volume is very small. Well, here's a patient, and these are diastolic pictures, who has a very small <clears throat> and diastolic volume, <clears throat> generally less than 55 cc's per meter square. <clears throat> this patient um, has a lot of symptoms. And as pioneered by Dr. Schaff at Mayo, um, the apical myectomy done through an apical incision can greatly en enhance the size of the LV. The LV and diastolic volume here is increased. Um, and so here, we're not trying to relieve obstruction. We're trying to um, increase the end diastolic volume and the stroke volume. And we definitely recommend this as a consideration before transplantation. And we've been doing this uh, pretty much routinely at our place now for the last three years. Uh, sometimes Dr. Swistle goes through the aortotomy. He often goes through the apex as well. Clearly, this is a palliative treatment. It's not curative, but it does improve patients' symptoms by one New York Heart Association class. Um, and <clears throat> has a low mortality. Um, if patients are not a candidate for this, transplantation is a consideration and we are active referrers for transplantation for both people with LV systolic dysfunction and also for people who have small um, end diastolic volumes that we can't get better any other way. But the advantage of this operation is that a patient can have a long life without the morbidity and potential mortality from transplantation, which can include, as you know, multiple admissions to the hospital, um, the need for um, for tacrolimus and uh, immunosuppressive therapy and the risk of uh, of long term coronary disease and uh, um, and cancer. Um, so this is what this can look like. Here's a patient who has uh, uh, the LV is encroached by this this very thick muscle and there's a small and diastolic volume. This is uh, another view of the same patient. You can appreciate how small this is, and this is the typical. Doppler pattern in this patient. Now, this is not really obstruction, even though the velocities are somewhat high. These are the last red cells in this patient's heart that are being ejected at high velocity. And yet you can appreciate it's not obstruction because this is short. This duration is short. Now, this is the post uh, myectomy um, um, image. And, and this patient you know, has a, a larger end diastolic volume now. 
uh, on, and here's the uh, another view, and no longer has that abnormal Doppler pattern. And here is before and after um, this extended myectomy. And so could, this can be described as a, in the vernacular as a three scoop myectomy. If the regular myectomy is a one scoop uh, myectomy, like an ice cream cone, this is, this is three scoops. So moving on to the more common scenario of LV alpha tract obstruction, the mitral valve is swept by the pushing force of flow into the septum and then once it touches the septum, the gradient itself um, pushes the mitral valve further into the septum. Um, um, and so here is a typical um, SAM case with a very floppy, very long anterior mitral leaflet. The three necessary conditions for systolic anterior motion are one, that there has to be an anterior position of the mitral coaptation plane, which puts the valve into the edge of the outflow stream has to be a positive angle of attack between outflow that hits the valve from behind and the protruding leaflet. In obstructive HCM, this is caused by the septal bulge, which displaces LV flow that comes from posterior, posteriorly and laterally, and on its way out the outflow tract, it catches the valve and pushes it into the septum. And then the other and final necessary condition is cordal slack, because without cordal slack, the valve is just going to sit there and it's not going to move because there's no, no give in the system. Um, so these patients have redundant valves. There's rarely urgency in the treatment of obstruction. We stop vasodilator medicines that decrease the size of the heart. And most patients respond to pharmacotherapy. And, and remember the admonition to avoid harm. So by the guidelines, most patients with HCM will respond to pharmacotherapy um, before moving on to myectomy or ablation. And a very large number of the patients who come to us are, are on the drugs that are vasodilators that make them worse. And this is because they're so common in clinical practice of, of cardiology. These patients have, um, they're on um, ARBs, they're on uh, prills, uh, ACEs, and sartans. They're on nifedipine, amlodipine, and they're on um, medicines to improve uh, prostatic obstruction. And, you know, these drugs all make patients worse. I, I would say these are the worst offenders, but these are also offenders. And, and you know, the patients come in on antihypertensive. So the very first step is to get the patients off these medicines and on other medicines. And, you know, I, I'll just mention that beta blockers, verapamil, to a lesser extent, cardizem, very low dose diuretic, and very helpful is the clonidine patch, which works centrally in the, they're your friends in this condition um, for, for, for treating hypertension. Uh, clearly, we want to avoid these drugs, which make obstruction worse. And we tell patients to avoid um, amphetamines for ADD, uh, which have a black box for all patients with heart disease, especially patients with LVH. So, you know, in a very real sense, uh, our practice is through the looking glass. Um, uh, you know, our whole approach to pharmacotherapy is different from the patients with heart failure and different for patients with um, coronary disease. And, and um, it's a, it's a mirror world. So how should we treat symptoms and gradient of obstructive HCM patients who don't respond to beta blocker or verapamil? And this, you know, this is step three. And the treatment options in 2023 include disapyramide, which is very good for obstructive HCM. The myosin ATPase inhibitor is mavicamptin, and in trials, aftecamptin. And then the invasive options, surgical septal myectomy, alcohol septal ablation, and less, um, less commonly applied these days, DDD pacing with short AV delay in the elderly and frail or patients who already have devices. So what's in our tool chest for treating obstruction? Well, we wanna decrease the LV ejection acceleration and thus decrease the pushing force on the mitral valve. So when talking to the patients, they want to say, well, doc, how is this medicine going to help me? How's it going to work? 
We show them on the heart model that the mitral valve looks like a leaf. And we say, imagine you're crossing the street and imagine that the blood flow is the wind. And we're going to decrease the acceleration and the velocity of the wind and thus decrease the force on the valve. And they understand that. So this comes from Mike Pfeiffer up to Mass General, HCM with symptoms. I must say we usually go this route and not for Apamil unless there's hypertension. Um, and then if patients are resistant to beta blocker, we'll generally add disapyramide here um, in, in past years. Um, and disapyramide um, is a drug we've been using for 25 years. We'll talk a little bit about that. Patients who fail medical therapy get mechanical therapy. And at our place, almost all the patients wind up getting myectomy because it works better than ablation. It's more effective. So this shows how um, negative inotropes work. This is now upstream from the mitral valve in the ventricle itself. And here is this ejection acceleration. This is upstream from the gradient. This patient had a 96 millimeter gradient. And here with slowed acceleration, there was no mitral septal contact. And this is the way, way negative inotropes work, including, we believe, the, the more novel ones. Here's another example. <clears throat> and if you want to, you can read this paper about how they work. But suffice it to say, when you slow acceleration, mitral septal contact happens later. And there's less time for this amplifying feedback loop to happen. And so there's a lower pressure gradient. What about disapyramide? Well, it's a multi-channel blocker. It's not just a sodium channel blocker. It has effects on the late sodium channel, which is very beneficial. It's a calcium channel blocker. It blocks calcium channel release of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And it decreases resting gradients, and it helps patients' symptoms about two-thirds of the time. The starting dose is 450 milligrams a day using the regular release preparation and 153 times a day. And the dose can be increased to 200 milligrams three times a day. And it has a 1B recommendation by the 2020 guidelines uh, from the AHA and the ACC and a 1B recommendation just reiterated by the ESC guidelines. And the reason why it works better is that it's just a stronger negative inotrope. And here, uh, the percent decrease in gradient was 59% in this in this uh, study done head to head with all these three drugs tried one after another in Japan, as opposed to next to no change with verapamil. <clears throat> Most often used in combination with beta blocker for its effect on exercise gradient and to slow atrial conduction if the patient should develop a fib, so, so AV nodal conduction. There can be vagolytic side effects, exacerbation of prostatism. It should not be started in patients with prostatism or who have impaired global systolic function. The vagolytic side effects can be mitigated by cholorestorase inhibitors, time release mestinon. And this, this is what the uh, gradient hap, you know, looks like. It, it just decreases uh, right away with the dose in the cath lab. This is work we did showing that gradient went away and then wash out it came back <coughs> sorry about this cough <clears throat> anyway um, with more use of this we found that if we gave dosapyramide to 221 patients uh, that about two-thirds of them had a very good response and the ones that failed went on to have surgery. Some of the patients had surgery before disapyramide uh, because they had either a contraindication or a very low mitral valve, very high gradients. And for all the patients, we, we did get rid of the gradients. Um, and for all the patients with disapyramide, you can see there's a nice decrease in gradient. 
uh, for the people who failed disapyramide, who still had gradients of 40, those patients went on to have surgery and we abolished the gradient that way. And, but without a doubt, the best way to abolish gradients is, is, is surgery. And, you know, in patients treated with this schema, uh, there was no difference in the survival between the U.S. expected mortality and the patients treated with what we describe as stepped management of, of obstructive HCM. So in the 168 patients and are treated in an outpatient setting in, in Toronto, uh, there were no cardiac events within three months of starting DISO. So, and you know, it was very well tolerated in 255 patients, only two patients had syncope of unknown cause and no deaths. So, <clears throat> The last five years, we've been treating patients as outpatients. Um, I have no, have no problems with that. Now we educate the patients. We tell them the drugs to avoid. We tell them you know, what to do and how to reach us and so on and so forth to discuss. But uh, we, we start them as outpatients now. And if you're interested in learning how to start disapyramide these days, you can look up this, uh, this, uh, this paper that was in progress uh, that we um, – wrote to help the clinical cardiologist uh, uh, take care of uh, patients with uh, DISO. So that's where we were up to about a year ago. But now we have something new. We have this newly approved drug, Mavicampin, um, which is a myosin ATPase inhibitor. And we hopefully will have Afikampin at some time in the future. And, you know, I think we're still of figuring out exactly um, how this will work in the paradigm, uh, but it's uh, certainly they're certainly strong and and highly effective drugs, and they're selective. They don't, they don't have the problem of dry mouth and constipation or, or exacerbation of prostatism because they only work on the heart. They're selective allosteric inhibitors of myosin ATPase that reduce excessive contraction of HCM myocardium by reducing cross bridges between the myosin and active myofilaments. This is what they look like. Um, and in mice, not only are they useful for uh, relieving obstruction, but there's at least the possibility that in mice, when treated very young, uh, they might have an effect on fibrosis, which is this blue, and they might actually decrease hypertrophy. But you know these these mice were treated very young. We don't know uh, at this point. There's no substantial evidence that there's a that there's a change with these drugs on the myocardial substrate in HCM patients, and so consequently the manufacturers can't claim that. The Explorer study uh, put these drugs on the map uh, and got them approved by the FDA. If you look at this um, uh, particular slide here, um, these are the placebo patients, and this is the resting LV alpha tract created, and these are the patients treated with mavicampin, and these are the Valsalva gradients. So there's a very highly statistically significant decrease. Uh, there was next to no change in the ejection fraction, from about 74 down to 70. Um, the BNP decreased in the MAVR-treated patients, and the troponins, the sign of injury, decreased uh, in the MAVR-treated patients. And it made people feel better. So these are the MAVR patients, and these are the patients treated with placebo. And the blue are the patients who were New York Heart Association 1. And you can see almost 50% versus 21% here. Uh, all these patients had... Um, um, New York Heart Association two and three symptoms to begin with, and you can see there's a, a distinct decrease uh, and a statistically significant difference in the patient's uh, uh, symptoms. What about side effects? Well, in the 123 patients who were studied for 30 weeks in the Explorer study, interestingly, about 6% of the patients had a reversible drop in the LG ejection fraction less than 50%. In these seven patients, the average EF fell from 77% to 45%. 
So the take home message from this is that these, this is a strong agent. Now this drop in the ejection fraction is, is generally uh, reversible within two or three weeks. And so this is the reason why the FDA has a, this REMS program, which requires an echo every three months for the patients as we titrate their dose. And interestingly, 2% of the patients had an LV ballooning syndrome due to LV alpha tract obstruction. Uh, and this happened, both of these patients were in the, um, in the MAVA treated uh, group. Um, interesting. Um, but it turns out that one patient in the cytokinetics trial of AFDCAM also had LV ballooning. Uh, but this is another talk. Um, and, and, and that patient in the AFDCAM trial was in the placebo group. So, I mean, I think this got everyone's attention that LV ballooning uh, can be part of the clinical spectrum of obstructive HCM. So, um, this is a whole other talk. But basically, um, this is a strong agent based on this, and it's reversible. That's, that's what you have to remember about this, but it has to be given with caution. And the, the Valor trial were, were of sicker patients. These were patients who um, were candidates for myectomy. And here we have the treatment group. Uh, here we have the, the treatment group who uh, basically um, got um, substantially better uh, in terms of their gradient. And here is the placebo group. And then there was a crossover. And you can see that with the crossover, the gradients came down rather dramatically. And these are the Valsalva gradients all after the crossover. Uh, there was this rather dramatic uh, uh, combination of, the, uh, of, of uh, improvement in both groups after the crossover. And the number of patients who had septal reduction um, um, eligibility uh, because of their high symptoms and high gradients dropped substantially in the original MAVA group. And then when they crossed over, they too had a substantial uh, drop in their eligibility for myectomy. And their ejection fractions uh, had a little change. So what are the reservations about this study? And what do the patients really need to know? Um, we have now 85 patients on Mavicampin here at NYU, and we have another 15 who were in the studies that you know, got the patients approved, um, got, the, got the drug approved. At least we were, you know, we contributed a lot of these patients in these studies. Um, so they're newly approved, and there's no really long-term outcomes. And we don't really know what the effect is going to be of a long-term myosin ATPase inhibition. And will there be a benefit for mortality? And what will the effect be on sudden death? We don't know that completely. But I think the, the longest study patients have been in for about three years. And so far, no terrible adverse effects have, have, uh, have emerged. About 10% of patients dropped their EF with MAVA, potentially fewer with AFI. We'll see. Uh, the Mavicampton adverse effect can last for weeks. And so at least for now, the FDA requires, I believe, appropriately frequent echoes monthly for three months and every four months after that. So I think you can appreciate this is, this is an administrative challenge. I spent the whole beginning of the year trying to set this up. Um, and if anyone wants to talk with me about how to set this up, I'd be happy to discuss it. Will patients who initially no longer have a clinical need for surgery continue that way? Well, uh, we don't know that for sure. So this is a haiku uh, of what our, our hope is for HCM patients. Um, after weeks of watching the roof leak, I fixed it tonight by moving a single board. Gary Snyder. So the drug dosages in obstructive HCM or beta blockade increasing until the resting heart rate of 55 to 60. Dicepyramide regular release. And these dosages, Mavicampin 2.5 to 15 milligrams a day. So what else is in our tool chest? Well, for about 30 years, myectomy has been 
the gold standard for patients with obstructive HCI. And, and we are interested in surgically separating the inflow and outflow portions of the LV. So we want to either redirect flow anteriorly away from the mitral valve or drop the mitral valve in the LV cavity. And understanding flow drag as the dominant cause for SAM is of crucial importance for successful invasive strategies. But why did myectomy have such a difficult reputation in the beginning? Well, you see, here's a myectomy the way it used to be done. And you can see that the flow, as it's coming around the septal bulb, still catches the mitral valve and still pushes into the septum because this myectomy doesn't go far enough down into the LV. And so here, the flow is redirected anteriorly by the extended myectomy. And here, the way it's done now, is the papillary muscles are released from the anterior wall of the ventricle. And this allows the mitral valve to drop down. And so we're separating the, the two portions of the LV, the inflow portion from the outflow portions. And this takes a you know, fair amount of experience to do, but it's highly effective uh, for the patients who want a once and done procedure as opposed to a lifelong medication. The mitral valves can be long. Look how long these, these valves are. They're long as compared to a normal. And it's kind of a mystery why the mitral valves are long, but they definitely contribute to obstruction. We call this the nightcap mitral valve. The flow comes down here or around the septum and has to get around the outside on its way outside, and it catches this long valve. And We've seen enough of this, so we call it the nightcap mitral valve because of its elongated neck there and because of the uh, protruding nature. This is what it looks like on intraoperative TEE. You can appreciate this is the residual leaflet. This extends past the coaptation point of the mitral valve. It should be looked for in every patient with obstructive HCM. And this is a different view from 3D than you might expect be looking at in, in your normal mitral valve case, because the normal surgeon's eye view is looking down on the mitral valve, right, from above for the mitral prolapse. But here we're in the LV looking up, and we're looking for this tongue here, which is the residual leaflet. And why do we look for that? Well, because it is a, an important player in obstruction. And for about 45% of our patients, we want to do something for the mitral valve to shorten it. And you can identify intraoperatively which patients this, this is happening to um, because of the redundant chordae that are curlicued and because of um, this tongue, which is seen on the TEE. To do this safely, you have to have good cordal support on either side of the residual leaflet, and you have to be sure that there's going to be adequate coaptation of the valve, uh, at least about a centimeter, um, in, the, in the valve that's left after you take this tongue off. This tongue does not in any way contribute to the coaptation of the valve. So here's what these residual look, leaflets look like in the OR. And these are for patients who have these long leaflets. And this is what the TEE looks like. It's approaching the septum. We're looking now up at the closed mitral valve. And this is the residual leaflet here. And these are the chordae. And here's where Dr. Swistle has, has basically um, done this shortening of the mitral valve. And this is um, now submitted. Uh, for publication, but this is a long anterior leaflet, 34 millimeters. The mitral valve anterior leaflet should be 25 millimeters. This is the residual leaflet, which extends past the coaptation point. Here's the residual leaflet touching the septum. And here is what it looks like after the myectomy and the residual leaflet excision, the relax. And here is a shorter mitral valve. And this is the myectomy. And this is um, you know, this is pre-op here with the septal bulge and the residual leaflet. This is that same patient I've been showing you, and this is now um, after the operation. 
Um, so here, there's good separation of the inflow and outflow tracts. And this patient's going to do very well in the long term. So it is a mystery to figure out why the mitral valve elongates. And, and we don't have a complete answer, but we do know something about the residual leaflet because, you know, we got curious what we would see by light microscopy in these patients uh, who had this relaxed procedure. And so if you, if you look at this under the microscope, you see a completely disorganized um, um, elastic, uh, you know, layer and, and, a, and a completely just, you know, fragmented kind of um, collagen layer. And so we believe that at least for the residual leaflet of this valve is getting beat up by the flow. And, and it's getting, uh, there's a hydrodynamic um, effect that is uh, causing it to deteriorate. I should, you know, point out to you that when we compared our patients who had the shortening procedures uh, to people who had just myectomy alone, there was certainly no disadvantage to working on the mitral valve. Uh, and we believe that in fact, um, there's an advantage uh, because you have a more complete uh, operative repair. Moreover, uh, I shall point out that the, you know at eight years it was a 95% um, long-term survival for these patients. This is what these collagen layers look like. They're very disrupted. The elastic layers are disrupted. And I'll, I'll just move on briefly to end this talk and maybe answer a few questions. Uh, but this is a patient with mid-LV obstruction. And you can see where the mid-LV obstruction is happening here. And here at the is this mid LV obstruction, and now this is the post op gradient, which is gone, and the post op um, myectomy patient um, with a very nice repair. Um, so this is now um, a very good result, uh, and uh, these patients, as I've indicated, have good survival. Um, we believe that the myectomy is a better procedure than uh, alcohol septal ablation, mainly because uh, the patients um, um, have a more tailored response. They have a more tailored response to the, to the treatment. Um, and, and so consequently, they, uh, they can basically have the exact part of the septum you want removed. And uh, also they can, um, they can have um, their mitral valves worked on if, if that becomes necessary. Now, we'll point out that there are patients who, you know, have, um, you know, comorbidities, and those patients, you know, might not withstand a, a surgical procedure. And if that's the case, then alcohol ablation is, is a good option. One, one, one advances a, a balloon into the first septal perforator, it'll blow up the balloon, inject contrast, make sure that, that all the contrast has to go just to the septal perforator, it doesn't go to the papillary muscles or the lateral wall, the posterior wall, the ventricle. Then uh, inject uh, the alcohol, um, one cc for uh, 10 millimeters. Um, um, so if you have two millimeter, a two centimeter septum, you give about two cc's of 100% alcohol, and this can 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 work, but it takes it takes about two months to take effect. It can be a while. Um, to have uh, the benefits show up. And, um, um, you know, if you, you know, a lot of patients are, you know, when they come are very eager to, you know, get on with their lives. Um, but, you know, this will show you a, a good response uh, to a patient who had comorbidities. Uh, this patient has SAM, marginal septal contact, and then after an ablation, you can have a nice response. So, in conclusion, pharmacotherapy for patients with obstructive HCM is often effective and gratifying. Stop the vasodilator medicines. Severe pressure gradients and their symptoms can be improved with beta blockade, often in combination with isothermide. Mavicamptin, approved by the FDA, and potentially afficamptin, not approved yet, may prove even more effective long-term. Surgery is successful for obstruction when medications fail. For selected cases, it should be applied sooner. Non-randomized observational data suggests that gradient reduction may actually decrease mortality. And alcohol ablation should be reserved for patients who cannot have surgery because of other illnesses or age. 
Uh, and we feel that way mainly because it has the same side effect profile as surgery, um, same mortality, uh, same same or more pacemaker in, you know, incidence, but it, 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 it's not as effective uh, as re at reducing the gradient. Um, and, and, you know, that, that I, I think that's really uh, um, a, a deciding factor for many of our patients. Um, I um, will stop now and uh, hopefully answer some questions for you. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank, thank you very much, Dr. Sharad, for an excellent talk. A uh, good review about treatment for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, uh, just a couple of quick uh, uh, questions, and then I'll open it up for uh, the panel to discuss it with you. One is, uh, uh, I would like to get your comment on uh, uh, what I do for younger patients. I usually prefer getting myectomies for those patients because Otherwise, there'll be a long-term mevacamptin, and we don't know the long-term uh, effects and side effects of this medicine. For older patients, I usually prefer treating them with mevacamptin. So I would like to get your comment on that and see if uh, that's the right approach. Well, you know, shared decision-making is the is, is the name of the game. I mean, when, when we, we, we sit with the patients, we explain the risks and benefits of both approaches. The risk of myectomy um, is is one percent chance of dying. Um, there's another one percent risk of some other uh, nasty complication, which can include things like uh, a repeat operation or um, um, you know infection, um, rarely stroke. So I would say what I tell the patients is a ninety five percent chance of of great improvement, with about a two percent chance of of real badness, which can include the chance of dying and chance of um, a repeat operation or stroke. And so that's my standard talk about my activity. And then of course, there's some pain. And then also there's um, you know a month to recover. So, and then when I talk about MAVA, I talk about two limitations and one uncertainty. And uh, the two limitations are, uh, one, that we have to apply for their insurance and get their insurance to pay for it. And we have dedicated people who, here who are just remarkable, who just fight with the insurance company and they get it approved. And then, and then the other limitation is, is the, the uh, drop in ejection fraction. And so because of that, they have to come and get echoes. Um, and then the, the uncertainty is, is what the long-term results will be. And so I, I, I contrast those two. There are patients who we still start on on desipiramide because diso is particularly good for AFib. And it's good antiarrhythmic. Uh, there are patients who don't want that newfangled medicine, that new medication. They, just, they, want, they want a medicine that uh, has more track record. And desipiramide has been used for 20 or 30 years now. Uh, but um, it's a, it's a discussion. And then we say, look, think about it. <laughs> because there's no big rush. And, you know, this is an important decision. And, um, and, then, and then they come back and we, we, we try to figure out what to do for them. Um, but um, not infrequently, we'll, we'll say, look, you know, you can also go talk to the surgeon. And the surgeon will, will talk with them about, um, about his, his thoughts about it. So um, I hope that's, that's a long answer, but um, we do have young people who are who started on Mavicampton because that's what they prefer. Uh, I don't think we, I think we should someday have a trial of surgery versus Mavicampton or surgery versus Afficampton. We should suddenly, because we know um, the, 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 the benefits of surgery, which are dramatic. Um, and, um, you know, the patients often come and they say, oh, I really wish I had this operation earlier. Why did I wait so long? <laughs> but okay, so I hope that answers your question. No, absolutely. The one, one other just a quick comment. So there are, you know, I have had few patients who were diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, even on Mavacampton, who have taken them off of the treatment after we found out they really had amyloidosis. 
So that's another thing which is, I think, important for um, uh, people to know that. Uh, and also some of the amyloidosis uh, uh, patients who were diagnosed for amyloidosis really had hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So right. one has to think about these two diseases as in differential when you have these patients. Right. Very important. Um, so let me ask you this. The patients who were on MAVA, did they have SAM and mitral septal contact? So they had asymmetric septal hypertrophy, but uh, the older African-American patient, and uh, they did not have uh, uh, SAM, but they did an MRI, and MRI was read as suggestive of uh, uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and patient right. was started on uh, Well, you know, I mean, I think that starting people with non-obstructive HCM um, with MAVA, like, you know, is, is a, unfortunately is a, you know, it's not, that's definitely off label. I mean, it's not, and, and it's, a, you're right. giving now a new drug off label. So I, yeah. I, we have not done that. So we're right. restricting so not, MAVA to patients with obstruction. So I, I right. whether that's right or not, I, in the long run, yeah. I think that these drugs are, are going to be helpful in some patients with non, non-obstructive HCM. I, I think they will be helpful. But the thing that's revolutionized the treatment of, of amyloid, which of course I know you know, is the PYP scan. Because you can really diagnose now uh, without doing a biopsy patients who have amyloidosis. And so for patients with non-obstructive HCM, uh, we will often recommend a PYP scan to see if they have um, um, amyloidosis. And if they do, we refer them to our amyloid clinic and um, they, 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 get, they get, get the, one of the two drugs that are indicated for that particular condition. Um, we have seen some patients with amyloidosis who can have LV alpha tract obstruction. And so we think that those patients have both, that they just have both conditions. Uh, so um, um, we figured that out because the myectomy specimens showed both HCM and amyloidosis at the same time. Other questions? Dr. Dunran and Dr. Yeah, Dunran. I have, I know a lot of people would like to ask him questions too. Just one question, uh, Dr. Sherrod. Thank you for that very uh, comprehensive presentation, by the way. Um, you mentioned about having 85 patients on Mavacamptin. Right. Um, how many of those have you actually started up front or do you always do a stepwise approach to their medical therapy? We'll always give um, um, a beta blocker first. And then I would say um, about 30% of them have been on, have, have had a trial of bacitromide as well. So very rarely do you start it from the get-go? So we don't, we don't start it from the get-go without a beta blocker. See, the, the beta blockers are, are good for, for exercise gradients. I mean, what limits many of the patients is they can't, they can't exercise, they can't increase their stroke volumes because they're obstructed. And MAVA doesn't do anything to the heart rate, and it doesn't do anything to the exercise enhancement or contractility that happens with exercise. So we 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 give beta blockers. Right. Thank you. Now there, there, well. yeah. there will be a study. There is a study ongoing right now of Afikampton versus beta blocker. So we'll we'll see which. You know, so there's, these studies are ongoing, but at least in 2023, we, we definitely give patients a trial of beta blockers. Hi, Dr. Sherrod. We'll, um, we'll often we'll often add the beta blocker to the to the mix. Yes. Uh, thank you for the talk. I had a question just for, coming from the transplant side of uh, cardiology. Uh, for patients that have a burnt out ejection fracture, it's a little more straightforward when to refer. For advanced therapies, my question comes for patients that have, you know, preserved ejection fractions, but you know, as you mentioned in your talk, very small end diastolic volumes, um, limiting their ability to augment their cardiac output. How do you risk stratify? Like, does CPET have a role for, um, you know, when to refer for advanced therapies and transplant? Is that something that you follow your patients with? We do them, but I think that it, I think that actually they will tell you when they're when they're ready. Because they will say, Doc, I can't walk a block anymore. And to me, that's more important than any test. Um, so when they really are high, a high class three, 
or a low class four, that's the time they should be referred. And you know, I, I will tell you that um, also we use the MRI to help differentiate who might benefit from surgery versus who might benefit from transplant. If they have a 25% fibrosis um, in their LV walls, um, it's likely that the myectomy, the extended myectomy, the, the, tri the, the procedure to expand the end diastolic volume, that probably isn't going to help them um, because those patients have a lot of fibrosis. But if they have um, a lesser amount of fibrosis, um, and mainly muscle, uh, those are the patients who I think could benefit from this apical myectomy. Um, so, I think that, um, that the patients who, um, who really um, basically are running out of options and they just can't, can't function in daily life, those are the patients you have to think about for advanced, um, advanced, advanced therapy. And we have had patients who've had reasonable CPETs, maybe 18, um, VO2 max, who we've referred for you know, transplant or myectomy, extended um, apical myectomy mainly because um, of their inability to do anything, their inability to function. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sharad. It was an excellent uh, discussion, an excellent uh, talk. Thanks again uh, for giving us a great talk. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. And, and you know, thank you for your attention. Reach me at NYU if you have questions. You know, uh, it's mark at NYU and And cheers. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>